children, and welcome to my chamber. My name is Rotherick Gastblood, and I'm your host of Tales from the Dark Chamber. This week, we have a great show for you. Tales to make your skin crawl. Each week, my chambermate and I read a scary tale that we found on the internet, or perhaps left under some corpse. Either way, we think you're going to like it, and we're just dying for you to hear it. So sit right back, light a candle, and let's have a ghoul evening. <laughs> Oh, good God. Look what the cat left us last night. <laughs> Did you overdo your New Year's reverie last night, Woody? Oh, I feel half past dead. I mean... I know what you mean. Drink a little too much? You could say that again. I went to a New Year's party over at Boris's castle and... I have no idea what he put in that punch. Knowing Boris, that could be anything. Rum, vodka, blood, spino fluid, fetid runoff from the sewage treatment plant. Ugh, you can stop right now, Rothrick. I get the idea. I mean, it was good stuff, but... How much did you have? Well, after the first few, I kind of lost count. But man... Boris can throw a party. Yeah, there was this girl there, really beautiful, dressed in some white gown, a tall, dark, wavy hair, and a, a beehive, and some tripping silver streaks running up the sides above her eyes. Wait. About five foot three, had a blank stare, walked with a slight stutter, didn't talk too much. Yeah, that's her. That's Frankie's wife. Frankie. Better known as Frankenstein, or rather, his creation. Oh, Lord. Well, good thing we didn't hit it off. Uh, she didn't even seem to notice me. Oh, well. How was your New Year's Eve? Oh, same old, same old. Hung someone out around the graveyard. I, I mean, hung out around the graveyard. So, are we okay to do the final installment of tonight's story? Oh, yeah, I just need to get a few aspirin and we'll begin. So this is part five of What the Hell Pricked Me. Our tale takes a wild ride tonight. Last episode, Stan was in the Internet Cafe where he was attacked by those black roses coming from the computer monitors. As he was trying to escape, the patrons there were possessed by Bathim and turned into his minion. Clamoring to escape, Stan was surprised to see Patrick of all people come to his rescue. But before he could leave... Stan sees the black roses in his computer monitor moving closer to his parents' house. Folks, this is about to get creepy. What the hell pricked me? Part 5 I left clear instructions for you not to leave, were the first words the pastor said to me as soon as I entered the house. Before he could go on to give me a reprimanding lecture, I managed to stammer out, He's going after my parents. The pastor widened his eyes and demanded for me to tell him what had happened. When I told him all that I went through ever since I left the house, Father Hernandez called out for Joseph. The tall, thin, handy man came in dipping a biscuit into a jar of peanut butter before he threw the biscuit into his mouth. This would have made me vomit if my mind wasn't too preoccupied with concern over my parents' safety. Code 10, the pastor vociferated. Oh boy, Joseph exclaimed as he dropped the jar of peanut butter and raced out of the lounge. Don't worry, senor. We will get this demonio, Father Hernandez assured me. You first need to clean up. Then we go and help your parents. For the second time in two days, I washed off black slime from my body in the pastor's bathroom. When I was done, I found Father Hernandez, Joseph, Rebecca, in the garage where they were loading guns into a black crimson open pickup truck. The guns were quite a lot. I saw AK-47s, a couple of shotguns, 
a few revolvers, and other big black guns. I have no idea what they are called. Senor Sanford, you are done. Good. We need to get a move on, the pastor yelled out to me. I remained rooted where I stood with my eyes bulged out to the extent of almost popping out of their sockets. I tried to process what I was seeing. Where did the pastor get all these guns? Why does he even have them? Isn't God enough to protect him? The pastor walked over to me and placed a hand on my shoulder. Don't worry. We will save your parents. I have a plan to exorcise the demon from this world. Why do you have all these guns? I asked, ignoring his affirming words. The pastor sighed and briefly looked back at Rebecca and Joseph, who were still loading the truck before he turned back to me. I have a complicated past, senor. A past I am not proud of. I wasn't always like this. I used to be a very bad man. I was once a part of a powerful Mexican mafia. I did terrible things that you would not believe. But I soon discovered God and decided to turn my life around. The mafia would not allow it. Only way out is death, is what they told me. Then they killed my wife. I blew the whistle on them. But some of them are still out there. Rebecca and I got witness protection where I was eventually become a pastor. I still had all my guns and my weapons from my days in the mafia and was about to do away with them when I was introduced to demon tracking. I know Rebecca already told you about that. I didn't know how he knew that, but uh, there was no point in denying it, so I nodded my head. The pastor reached into his pocket and took out a rubber bullet, which was carved in a cross in the middle. The reason that I said you should not use the power of that marker on your finger is because there are better ways of removing an evil presence from possessed individual. Of course, you can use a crucifix and so forth, but if you shoot them with this rubber bullet, which is soaked and anointed in holy water, the evil inside them is quickly expelled. White flames light up in their eyes, and they throw up black mire and usually collapse after that. They will have to nurse a sore spot when they wake up, but at least they would have survived. Different demon trackers use different methods, which all aim to make sure the person survives, and my method is no different. We're all done here, Padre, Joseph yells out. Let us get a move on. I will explain everything else on the way the pastor said to me as he briskly walked towards the truck. Joseph jumped into the back of the truck while I climbed up front into the passenger seat. You are not going, Mejia. Father Hernandez sternly broke the news to Rebecca, who was prepared to climb into the seat next to me. She was about to argue when the passenger held up his hand. We have talked about this, Rebecca. It's too dangerous. End of discussion. Should I at least call back up for you? She asked. We will be fine. I have a plan, the pastor said dismissively. Rebecca sighed held my hand and whispered to me, Be safe. She then closed the truck's door and watched us drive off. It was a fairly quiet six-hour drive to my hometown. The journey was hardly eventful, and I barely spoke to the Reverend. He only spoke briefly about demon tracking and told me that there are many trackers around the world like Patrick who saved me in the cafe. He also said I didn't need to worry about being convicted for Candace's death because he talked with his connections at the police. As for the people I had killed in the cafe, he first scolded me like a child and said he will handle it when we get back. He also spoke about his plan. Besides that, he didn't seem inclined to talk much. Neither did I. I was too concerned about my parents, and I didn't feel well. I tried calling both of my parents a couple of times using the pastor's phone, but neither of them picked up. This augmented my worry. The sun had already gone down when we arrived. It was a bittersweet experience for me coming back to my hometown. It had been months since I had been there, so I was enthralled to be back. But I was also anxious of probably finding my parents murdered by Bethim. I didn't have many friends besides Craig when I was growing up, so every time I came back home, I was only visiting my parents. I had lost touch with Craig after high school, but I knew he had also moved away from the town. I directed Father Hernandez to the suburb where my parents live. Just outside of the suburb, there is a large park where Craig and I always used to play in. It wasn't much of a park because it was poorly managed and overran with weeds. It was more of a bush than a park. Most parents didn't want their children playing in that deplorable park, but as hot-headed kids, Craig and I spent most of our time there. Craig would travel from the other side of town and come and hang out with me in that park bush. This is how I began loving walks in the woods. A thousand memories floated in my head as we passed that bushy park. There was a dead silence in my parents' suburb when we arrived, and not a single person was on any of the streets. The suburb isn't ritzy, 
But it also isn't the kind to have junkies, drug dealers, and gangs roaming the streets at night. But usually, there would always be a few people in the streets. Some will be joggers, and others will be lovers taking a stroll under the stars. But on that night, there was no one outside. So we thought. The pastor slowed down, and his eyes looked around at the suburban houses of the neighborhood, which all seemed to have the same gardener. The houses all had well-cut grass, trimmed hedges, a few fruit trees in the yard, and white picket fences. I felt angst because all the houses had their inside and outside lights switched off. It was like everyone had decided to go to bed early. Besides the flickering street lights, the truck's headlights, and the half moon in the sky, there were no other light source. I could tell Father Hernandez was as concerned as I was. Something was awry. When we were three streets away from my parents' house, the front porch lights of all the houses began switching on. That was when we noticed people standing outside their houses. Family after family were standing on the front porch of their houses in a straight horizontal line. They were all dressed in their pajamas. Their eyes were pitch black with a red vertical line in the middle. Their faces were rumpled up as if their skin had been hand-washed in cold water. They were all inert as they stared at the truck as it passed by. When we were about two streets away from my parents' house, the whistling started. It was so loud it sounded like the jeers of a football crowd. I had no idea where it emanated from because the lips of all the people standing by their houses never moved. The whistling resonated all around the truck, and I was afraid the windows will shatter at any moment. I think the pastor's apprehension was growing because he decided to speed up the truck. When we were one street away from our destination, the clanking of metal on metal accompanied the whistling. It was also a mystery where this sound came from. The whistling and clanking of metal were in such perfect harmony with one another, I was expecting that the black-eyed people to break into a song at any given moment. But it never happened. I was very disappointed. Since the pastor's eyes kept veering from side to side, I was the first to see her. A young girl of somewhere between six and ten years old was standing up ahead in the middle of the road. Her platinum blonde hair was tied into a double ponytail. She was wearing white stockings, black shiny shoes, and had a white dress with red suspenders. She was holding a brown teddy bear in her left hand and huge red lollipop in her right hand. She would have been adorable if it weren't for her black eyes and wrinkled face, which looked like the grimace of an old woman. I yelled at the pastor to look out, and when he noticed the girl, he made a sharp right turn. The truck swayed and crashed into a thick oak tree on the side of the road. I had never been in an accident before, and to say I was shaken up would be an understatement. Both the pastor and I were unharmed, but I was shaken. Okay, shaken does seem like the best word. The airbags did their job. I looked back at Joseph. After the crash, he had fallen on his back and was now getting up. He also appeared to be fine. I realized the whistling and clanking of metal had stopped. That deafening silence had returned. It was so quiet, you could hear a feather drop. Father Hernandez opened his door and immediately the whistling resumed. From the close-by houses and up the street, we saw the black-eyed family sprinting towards us. My heart leapt to my mouth because these demonized people were running towards the truck as if they were being powered by jet fuel. The pastor threw a shotgun on my lap and commanded me to follow him as he climbed out of the truck. The loud banging of an AK-47 then clamored my ears. When I looked back, I saw Joseph was using the gun to fire away at the myriad of black-eyed people racing towards us. I got out of the truck and tried to lift up my shotgun, but the weight of the gun caught me by surprise. I nearly took a nosedive to the ground and wondered if now was a good time to tell either the pastor or Joseph that I had never used a gun before. But I then decided just to have a go at it and pulled up the gun with great effort. I aimed at a middle-aged brunette woman who was galloping towards me. I pulled the trigger and my body jerked back into the side of the truck. As a bullet hit her chest, the woman's body flew back with white flames roaring in her eyes. I dropped the shotgun because the vibration it made when I pulled the trigger added more pain to my still recovering right hand with no fingernails. I took out the crucifix Patrick gave back to me at the cafe because I knew that it would be a more appropriate weapon for me to use. I just wasn't sure how I would use it efficiently at the gobs of black-eyed people who were speeding towards me. Joseph then jumped out in front of me. He no longer had his AK-47. He was now holding a crucifix in one hand and a bottle of holy water in the other. He extended his arm and clotheslined the chest of a tall teenage boy with long black hair who was rushing towards him. 
Joseph then flew down with his elbow on the fallen boy. He threw water on the young man's face, and white flames combusted in the boy's eyes. The teenage boy retched out black slime and passed out. Joseph quickly got up and kicked an old woman in the stomach. He put her head under his arms and lifted her upside down before he suplexed her to the ground. He dove down on her small body with his elbow and washed her face with water from his bottle. Again, the church handyman was fast to spring up to his feet and spear-tackled two blonde twin girls to the ground. He rose up and sprayed them with water from his bottle before he kneed the nose of a short Indian man with thick round glasses and a heavy black mustache. He then used his bottled water to make it rain on the Indian man, who instantly puked out black slime and fainted. Joseph then rinsed his crucifix with holy water and threw it at a chubby woman with auburn bob cut hair, who was running at him with a baby in her arms. The crucifix hit the woman in the forehead, and she fell on her ass with white flames burning in her eyes. The baby, who had fallen out of the mother's arms, locked her black eyes on Joseph and crawled towards him with abnormal speed. I thought Joseph would go easy on the baby, but my jaw dropped when I saw him sprinkle water on the leg of the baby before he kicked the child like a soccer ball. I held my breath as the baby flew up in the air with white flames in her eyes. Fortunately, the child landed safely on the heavyset unconscious body of the mother. Joseph didn't care less as he gripped the throat of a skinny guy with an orange mohawk as he choke-slammed him to the ground. He then crushed down on the mohawk guy with his elbow and showered him with holy water. I was impressed with Joseph, but I also thought he was overdoing it with the wrestling moves. Move, senor, the pastor yelled at me from the other side of the truck. I dashed over to the priest and found him having a better fortunes with his shotgun. Any doubt that I had about the man being in the mafia was vanquished then. He fired to his left at a pot-bellied man who had gray hair and balding scalp. The man caught the rubber bullet with his stomach and fell face down to the ground. The pastor swiftly turned to his right and fired at a brawny, blonde-haired guy. The bullet thwacked the blonde man on the left shoulder and sent him tumbling to the ground. Father Hernandez was spry as he turned ahead and fired a bullet into the crinkled face of the little girl who caused us to crash. Part of me felt sorry for the girl, but the pastor seemed unmoved as he continued shooting at the scads of black-eyed people running towards us. The pastor then scurried to the closest house and screamed for me to follow him. We ran into the house and barricaded the front door with different kinds of furniture. <sighs> Where is your gun? The breathless pastor asked over the noise of possessed people banging on the door from the other side. I lost it, I stammered out. If there was ever a time for me to speak up on my inexperience with guns, it was then. But I never did. Instead, I asked, Is Joseph going to be all right? <sighs> he will be fine. Is there a shortcut from here to your parents' house? As I told him of a route we can use, Father Hernandez threw me a revolver. <sighs> Great. Let's go, he commanded me as he scuttled towards the back door of the house. I took a moment to look out the window at Joseph, and sure enough, he was doing well. He had abandoned his wrestling moves for the shotgun he was using to blow away anyone who came within a meter of him. I ran after the pastor with the revolver in one hand and the crucifix in the other. We climbed over the backyard fence to a house on the next street, which happened to be the street with my parents' house. We managed to slink over to my parents' home within a few minutes without grabbing the attention of any possessed person. I noticed someone was standing on the roof of my parents' white and blue double-story home. I realized him almost immediately. Jim Blair. Back in high school, Jim was the kind of jock who fought his boredom by picking on kids less popular than him. He often beat Craig and I for the sake of it. I lost count how many times he took our lunch money, knocked down our books from our hands, and tripped our feet in the hallways. I knew nowadays he worked in his father's garage, and he's a bigger jerk than he was in high school. He was standing on the roof with his hands in his pockets of his faded gray skinny jeans. His burly body seemed too big for the dark blue t-shirt he was wearing. I was petrified when his black eyes focused on where the pastor and I hid as we plotted on what to do next. I see you, Stan. Don't be shy. Come on out, Jim shouted in the same bone-chilling voice Candace used in her apartment. The pastor and I stood up from behind the hedges of the opposite house, realizing that it was probably not a good hiding spot. We walked over to the middle of the road. Jim's black eyes remained concentrated on us. He smiled malevolently as he ran his hand through his shiny black hair, which was neatly trimmed into an undercut style. Where are my parents? I yelled at him. 
You don't have to worry about them. They are fine for now. You know, all of this could have been avoided if you had just accepted Bathim in the cafe. I want to see my parents, I bellowed at him. Jim laughed. He laughed longer than I expected. I think he spent a whole minute laughing before Father Hernandez loaded his shotgun, aimed, and fired at him. But Jim was quick. He evaded the bullet as he leapt up into the air like a soaring eagle and landed right in front of the pastor with a loud thud. He knocked down the shotgun from the reverend's hands before he sank his teeth into the pastor's neck like a deranged vampire. Father Hernandez screamed as he fell to the ground. Everything happened so fast. I barely had time to react enough. When I tried to shoot Jim with my revolver, he backhand slapped me to the ground. I plummeted to the cold, hard tar of the road like a sack of potatoes and dropped both my revolver and my crucifix. Jim kicked away my weapons and started laughing again as he slowly walked to the lawn of my parents' house. I crawled over to the pastor, who had blood gushing from his neck. Black veins rapidly slid from his wound to the rest of his body. In a matter of seconds, his whole body turned tire black, and then it gradually corroded into white rubble. My mind was still trying to come to terms with what just happened, but my eyes already knew the pastor was dead, so they welled up with tears. An enormous amount of dread ached in my heart as I stared at the white dust in front of me, which was a human body a few seconds ago. I really didn't want to do that. I wanted all of this to be resolved diplomatically, Jim said with the pastor's blood dripping from his mouth. But now that you have seen what I can do, don't test my temper again. Screw you! I don't care if you kill me, I cried out. Kill you? Who said anything about killing you? Jim looked back at my parents' house and the front door opened. Two beefy men with black eyes came out of the house holding my parents on the back of their heads, like terrorist prisoners. They made my parents kneel in the front lawn of the house. From behind me, I saw Joseph also apprehended by two other hefty men with black eyes. They made him kneel in the lawn with my parents. Rumi, you still alive? Good boy, Joseph shouted at me. If it wasn't for the tense situation we were in, I would have yelled at him. We had shared a room for one night, but already he considered me his roommate. Wait, where's the padre? What did you do to him, you? Joseph was cut off by Jim's strong right hand punch that caught him on the jaw. Jim turned back to me and bawled, I will kill them one by one as you watch, if you don't submit to Bathim right now. I looked over at my parents. My mother couldn't stop crying, and my father had his bruised face held down. The thought of them dying right before my eyes made my skin crawl. Okay, fine, I'll do it. Just please let them go, I pleaded with Jim. He chuckled. First. Let Bathim possess you, and then I will let them go. All you have to do is go into your mummy and daddy's house, and you will find him there. I got up and walked over to my parents. I love you, I softly mouthed to both of them. I love you too, Rumi, but don't go in there. There's got to be another way, Joseph surprisingly replied as he squirmed in the bindings on his hands. Sorry, man, this is my only option, as I said as I walked over to the front door. When I got to the lounge, I found a bed of roses on the coffee table. The malodor of a sewer is better than the pungent smell of which the lounge was submerged in. Red vines of the roses mantled the walls and roof, making the place look more like a weird licorice jungle than a lounge. I didn't move as the roses slithered up to me. I took a deep breath as they all pricked my right hand with their red thorns. This time there was no pain. As soon as they pricked me, everything went black. In the darkness, something spoke to me. Its voice was high-pitched and soft, the type of voice that would fit perfectly with a soprano section of a choir. Thank you, Stanford. You will not regret this, dear, it said. Bathim? I asked. Yes, dear. Where am I? You are in me, and I am in you, dear. I was aghast not only because the demon sound high-pitched, but also because of where I was. I had no idea that when you were possessed, your conscious self will be trapped in a black abyss. There was nothing I could see, feel, smell, or touch. I was as good as dead. But what do you even want with me? I asked with an overt trepidation in my voice. The demon laughed. 
I thought Candace explained everything to you, my dear. Yeah, but I was distracted at that time. I didn't hear anything she said. The demon guffawed. Ha ha ha, old Stanford, dear. I, uh, ah. Bathim suddenly made an ear-piercing shriek. A blinding white light illuminated from somewhere in the darkness, and the next thing I knew I was lying on the floor in my parents' lounge. Joseph was leaning down, slapping me and screaming, Come back to me, Rumi, come back! I sat up and realized the lounge was covered in black slime, and rays of sunlight shined from the window. It was morning. The roses were nowhere in sight. What happened? I asked Joseph. I can't retell Joseph's words verbatim because my head hurt badly at the moment, and he was speaking so fast I could barely keep up. But the gist of it goes like this. When I went into the house, Jim was very much prepared to kill Joseph and my parents. They all then heard the faint sound of a song playing in a distance. When Jim and his goons looked up the street, they saw a fat, naked Chinese man running towards them. His headphones were blasting Korean music, and a colorless liquid spritzed from his oily body. When some of the liquid landed on Jim and his crew, white flames kindled in their eyes. They vomited black slime and fell to the ground. Behind the Chinese man was a blue monster truck that had speakers peeling rap music. The monster truck sped up and parked in front of my parents' house. Out came Miss Brown with two machine guns in both of her hands. She fired wildly as she cursed at the scores of possessed people who were darting towards her with the speed of zombies from a movie. Soon, a helicopter dropped off Patrick and Rebecca. Patrick had his faithful sword and pistol with him, while Rebecca was using her bows and arrows, which were spewing out holy water on the black-eyed people. More and more demon trackers came into fight, each one stranger than the last. But even with the help of all the demon trackers who came, the possessed people were too many to overcome until a bright light glowed from inside my parents' house. That was when white flames torched the eyes of all the bedeviled people as they collapsed on the ground in unison. The story sounded too loony for me to believe, until I walked over to the window of the lounge. I saw a lot of people outside, including Rebecca, Patrick, my former boss, Donald, the guard, Miss Brown, my neighbor, the naked Chinese man from the grocery store, and a lot of other grotesque individuals I didn't know. They were carrying the knocked out bodies of people to their different houses. I didn't know how they knew who lives where, but they all seemed to know what they were doing. Then I recalled Father Hernandez's words. It's a strange world we live in, senor, and most people don't even recognize it. Rebecca came into the house. She ran and embraced me. I am so glad you are okay. What happened in here? she asked. Then I told her and Joseph of Father Hernandez's plan. Remember when I said I wasn't feeling well in the truck? It was because Father Hernandez had made me drink eight liters of holy water during the journey. The plan was for Bethim to possess me so that he is eradicated by the holy water inside my body. So when the demon took over my body, him and all of his possessive power that affected the neighborhood were exercised back to hell by the copious amounts of the holy water I drank. Holy water? Oh, you mean that big jar that was up front of the truck? <laughs> no, Rumi. That was the Pope's sweat, Joseph said. Wait, what? I screamed at him. Oh, yeah, that was the Pope's sweat. The church usually keeps jars of the Pope's sweat because they're great for exercising demons. Fiends can't stand that stuff. When the Padre went out yesterday morning, I'm sure he was collecting that sweat in a jar from the bishop. Joseph explained. My stomach turned like a merry-go-round, and I was overwhelmed with the urge to throw up. Please tell me you're joking. I am afraid he is not, Rebecca replied. Do you mean to tell me I drank eight liters of a man's sweat? I yelled. No, you drank eight liters of the Pope's sweat. It's the sweat of a religious man. You should feel honored, Joseph retorted with the grin of a Cheshire cat. I vomited in one of my mother's plants for what seemed like an eternity. I also realized that that's why the holy water was so salty. I never got the chance to ask how the church gets the sweat of the Pope or a thousand other questions I had about that because Rebecca then asked me of the whereabouts of her father. 
I have never said a more difficult sentence in my life than when I told her of what happened to the priest. She ran over to the white detrius, which was still in the middle of the road. She knelt down beside the dust and wept. Before we left town to go and make arrangements for the pastor's burial, I got to spend a few minutes with my parents. I tried as best I could to explain to them everything that had happened. I also saw Craig. He arrived just before I left and told me he was in town for a while. We exchanged phone numbers and I told him I would call him and we can catch up some other time. The funeral for Father Hernandez was two days later. A lot of people came, including some high-ranking Catholic priests and bishops from all over the country. It was an emotional occasion, especially for Rebecca. She seemed inconsolable. She asked me to stay with her for a while after the funeral. I don't remember saying much to her at the time, but I think my presence was helping her heal. She eventually completed her nun training and took her temporary vows in honor of her father's wish. Due to the great work Father Hernandez had done for the church, they allowed for her and Joseph to continue staying at the house. They also said another priest will be taking over soon at the church, but he hasn't arrived yet. Rebecca soon asked me to permanently move in with her and Joseph. I agreed, obviously. My relationship with her has slowly been developing into something more because these days I'm no longer Joseph's roommate, but hers. I'm not sure the new priest would like this, but who knows? He may be cool. For the past couple of weeks, the house behind the Catholic Church in the city center has been my home. It has been a place where I feel I belong. A place filled with love and a place filled with care. On my first day here, I made sure to get internet for the house, and I also brought my computer to modernize the place a little. I still have no idea why Bathim wanted to possess me so badly because he never got a chance to explain that. My right hand is now in a cast. Once again, Bathim left me with some of his juice, and this time it's a lot. The skin from my palm to my elbow glows light green. Rebecca is the one who suggested that my hand be placed in a plaster bandage to avoid me from killing anyone else. Besides that, things were going great for me. Patrick gave me my job back after he made me kneel and kiss his shoe. I also found a day to travel back to my hometown, where I met up and spent some time with Craig. I came back to the city a few days ago. This morning I received a text message from Craig. The text made my spine writhe. It read, Hi, Stan. How are you doing? It was great seeing you, dude. Do you remember that park we used to play in as kids? I bet you do. Anyway, I was feeling nostalgic today, so I went for a walk there. I came upon these roses. Dude, they were beautiful, but they smelled bad. They had red stems and black shining petals. When I tried to touch them, they pricked me. It hurt for a while, but the pain stopped. I've been asking around, but no one knows anything about roses like that. Do you have any idea what the hell pricked me? What the hell pricked me? By Sunfred. Well, folks, that's our story tonight. Rothrick and I hope you enjoyed it. We sure had a great time bringing it to you, and we really appreciate you listening. Tune in next week when we bring you another chilling tale from the dark chamber. And just a note, if you're an aspiring author and you want your story read here on Tales from the Dark Chamber, send us a note at talesfromthedarkchamber at gmail.com. If it creeps old Rothrick out enough, we'll air it. And subscribe to our podcast for notification of our next new episode or subscribe to our YouTube channel at Tales from the Dark Chamber and follow us on Instagram or Twitter. If you want your story read for your own use, or you just want to have it, check out my website at woodygvoiceover.net. You can order there, or you can find me on Upwork as Woody G. And again, thank you for listening tonight. <laughs>